Well, I'm here to talk about a dirty word with a dirty reputation. Telepathy. Makes me think of magicians and science fiction and psychosis. So what does the word actually mean? The Oxford says, it's the sending and receiving of ideas by a means other than the known senses. Okay, so does this actually exist? I'm gonna show you today how close we are, and you can decide. Now, I'm not a magician. I'm not a, from another realm. I'm not psychotic. Not psychotic. <laughs> Who's laughing? Actually, I'm a neurologist. Curious about the mysteries of the brain since I was a kid. Now I perform endovascular neurosurgery procedures. I have a PhD in the field of neural engineering, but now I run a tech company, and we're building something we think is going to be transformative. A technology implanted into your brain, not your brain, a brain capable of streaming direct thought for people who through injury or disease have lost the capacity to move or speak. A brain computer interface. Human communication without the need for our mouth, our fingers, just our thoughts. The story begins with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. For almost 50 years, DARPA has been funding critical scientific research that's led to the development of technologies that you all now take for granted. The internet, your mobile phones, GPS, robots, artificial intelligence. DARPA was behind all of it. And then 10 years ago, a new problem. Soldiers were surviving horrific blast injuries, making it back home, but without their arms and legs. DARPA neurologist Colonel Jeffrey Ling led an inspired effort to build a replacement arm, a robotic limb. And they did, and it's magnificent. And trust me, this arm can do things that none of your arms can do. When controlled by a computer. So the problem became, OK, how do you put the brain in charge of the robotic limb? How do you connect the electronic circuitry of the brain to the circuitry of the robotic limb. By 2008, several research groups, including Lee Hochberg's Brain Gate from Brown University, had, in fact, shown it was possible to control a robotic limb when directly connected to your brain. Incredible. OK, so why is it now, 10 years on, we still haven't seen this technology made available, available for use? Well, turns out it was complicated. So let's take a step back and look at what is a brain-computer interface. It fundamentally does three things. It senses, computes, and it controls. Sensing requires a, a sensor. A sensor that can read brain activity, OK? What is brain activity? Think of it as the pulse or the rush of electricity through the brain cells. To explain, I want you to imagine that the brain is a lake. Just bear with me, OK? Now, every drop of water in the lake represents a brain cell. In the lake is a fish swimming along a particular path, causing a ripple in the water as it swims. That fish represents a thought in the brain. Now, as it happens, the fish is invisible, OK? That's just the way it is. So if you want to detect the movement of that fish, you have to detect the ripple in the water. Now, the ripple can be seen under the water, or the ripple comes up, and it can be seen on the surface of the water. That's how we de detect a thought in the brain. Detect the ripple, and you've detected a thought. Now, we'll come back to sensors that can detect invisible fish later on, because we built one. But for now, let's keep going. Number two is compute. Computing requires an algorithm, an algorithm that turns the brain data into a useful form. And what algorithm is everyone going crazy for in 2018? Machine learning algorithm, artificial intelligence. OK, so now we have human intelligence directly connected to machine intelligence. And then number three is control. 
What is our system actually going to do? What's it going to control? That's the big question on the table today. To answer that, I'd like to tell you another story. In 2010, the late Stephen Hawking wrote The Grand Design, a monumental achievement, not only because this book attempted to explain the beginning of the universe, a theory of everything, but because Hawking, who had motor neuron disease, or ALS, wrote the entire book using a single infrared switch mounted on his glasses, capable of detecting activity in the final remaining controllable muscle in his whole body, a tiny little part on his cheek, which when activated then selected a letter. Single switch, letter by letter, Hawking wrote the entire book at the astonishing rate of less than one word per minute. Makes you wonder how incredibly lucky we are to have your face, your fingers, your thumbs, all under perfect working order from the command center in the brain. This command center in the brain is called the motor cortex. And from when we're born, it learns how to control all the muscles and joints in your body. It amazes me that in 2018, we still have not seen an accessible technology capable of recording a message and then taking it out to serve a useful purpose. ALS is not the only condition that results in this type of paralysis. Many of you here in the audience today may know patients, people with spinal cord injury, stroke, muscular dystrophy, loss of limb amputation. All of these things have something in common. The brain is working fine, but the message can't get out. What would Hawking have been able to do if rather than one switch, he had four switches? What if Hawking could have interacted with his computer communication system with 128 switches? The greatest mind connected to the most powerful computer? Okay, what book would he have written then? This is why, six years ago, my colleagues and I from the University of Melbourne set out to build a safer, more efficient electrode system. One that could be delivered into the brain but without the need for open brain surgery. A concept which, at the time, I was told by everyone, was not only crazy, but impossible. Everyone that is, except for that guy, Colonel Jeffrey Ling. Over this time, I've cold called the Pentagon. We've put together the groundbreaking team of the world's best engineers from Australia, Germany, and the United States. And we've had a public endorsement from President Barack Obama. We've built what we think is the most advanced neural interface technology yet seen, and it has the potential to change lives in a way that was not deemed possible even five years ago. So we made a decision. Robotic limb control is a problem that needs solving, and it will, but the technology is just not there yet. But communication augmentation, it's coming first. This form of digital telepathy is going to be the first use of this brain interfacing technology, and it's going to give a voice to people who are paralyzed, who have lost their ability to move and to speak. And here's how. Text messages. We all send them, probably too many. But I want you to consider this. When you send them, you use your senses, your vision, your sensation, and then your thumbs. But now there's something else. You let predictive text fill in the gaps. Algorithms that guess the ideas you want to send your friends. Sure, you choose the word, you hit send. But this augmentation technology helps speed things up. And that's for those of us who have our thumbs working. For those who don't, there's voice recognition, voice activation. These technologies are powered by machine learning algorithms that are rocketing our ability to interact with these communication mediums at an unprecedented rate. It's this cross-fertilization, this convergence of technologies that's going to lead to the breakthrough in the brain-computer interface space. I don't think it's unreasonable to tell you today that within five years, we're going to see the speed of this augmented typing under direct brain control, no hands, 
increase the speeds that will beat current thumb typing. But before we do, there's one problem. One problem that needs solving. The final technological hurdle that I think is holding back the brain computer interface space. And that is, what is the ideal sensor? How much brain activity detection is really needed for the system to be effective? Let's go back to the lake, the invisible fish, and those detecting those ripples. Now, there's two current sensors available for brain computer interface systems. The first is called non invasive EEG. The electrodes are placed on the outside of the skull. When you record through the skull, however, the data quality is poor. This would be like, back to the lake, standing on the far side, looking out for those ripples, give you a pair of binoculars, but in the setting of a snowstorm. Not easy. The second is called an invasive electrode. It's called a Utah array. Now, this thing is the current research gold standard, provides the highest quality data, but requires open brain surgery, leads to long-term brain inflammation, and leaves the patient with a wire sticking out of their head. This would be like taking a fishing net, dense fishing net, full of trip wires, dropping it in the lake, awesome ripple detection, but at significant cost and damage to the lake. So we came up with a third option. We were inspired by a natural protection mechanism within the brain. Imagine a water lily with enough buoyancy to take our full body weight that we never touch the surface of the water. We get our binoculars, we're right near the ripples, and we're ready to detect. Well, how is this possible? We utilized the natural highway to the brain, the blood vessels, specifically the veins. We used a technology that, for me, was the obvious next step for where we've come from. Why? Because 60 years ago, we achieved this already in the heart. You might have heard of it. It's called the pacemaker. This technology is implanted into the heart without the need for open heart surgery in a simple, quick, and pain-free procedure. Except this time, we're going up to the brain. In 2014, we built the first stent electrode neural interface prototype. We called it the Stentrode. In 2016, we showed for the first time that it could be implanted permanently. Now, in 2018, we've just finished building a wholly new system. It's ready for a world-first clinical trial, and at the current rate, we'll have that started by the end of the year, hopefully coming to Melbourne, Australia, the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Here's how it works. We come into the jugular vein in the neck using a catheter, make our way up through the skull into the brain, landing at the command center in the brain, right next to the surface of the motor cortex. The platinum sensors are built onto a self-expanding stent, which incorporates into the wall of the vessel. That's the water lily protection. As that happens, the signal quality gets better and better. But we never touch the surface of the brain, so we don't expect that brain inflammation. The motor cortex, the command center of the brain, is then activated by thinking. The sensors carry the information out of the brain, through the vein, and transmit them through a wireless antenna that we've implanted in the chest. We've built a software system from the ground up that enables patients to learn how to control an operating system using a new language, a digital language, that can control multiple applications. We've completely redesigned the concept of an operating system by removing the need for physical interaction. Communication augmentation will be first, but we have a vision of helping people, no matter what level of disability, to overcome that and take control of a digital world. And so, I've got something here to show you guys. You guys might have seen it sticking out here. Here it is. Digital spinal cord. What's it going to do? A spinal cord injury patient may be able to control a vehicle simply by thinking. A patient who's come home from a war, lost his arms, can pick up his children once again. 
and the next Stephen Hawking will have no limitations on his or her ability to not only understand but communicate the secrets of the universe. Is this telepathy? I think it's pretty close. I'll let you guys decide. Thank you.